Welcome to episode 19 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian for 12 years and counting, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that the ideas expressed in this podcast are my own, or when appropriate, I cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. This past Monday, we in the Metro Detroit area were treated to five inches of snow, which started around 11 a.m. and didn't let up until late afternoon. School superintendents around the neighborhood had the unenviable job of making the call as to whether or not we would have school. And like many school librarians who enjoyed having the day off, I live-streamed Midwinter's Youth Media Awards ceremony. I have had the best week with three days off of school and a ridiculous smile on my face, because despite the polar vortex, thanks to this podcast, I exchanged emails with not one, but two creators of children's books who are renowned and answered listener mail. I would like to give a shout out to Maricela in California. Thank you very much. That was a very validating opportunity to exchange emails. And I think the lesson that is to be learned is that you lose nothing by reaching out to others. What's the worst thing that could happen? Your email gets ignored. Your tweet isn't liked or retweeted. But what a wonderful affirmation when it does happen. Building a listener community is proving to be one of the most rewarding aspects of this undertaking. To introduce this week's episode, Podcasts and You, I would like to share this next segment, which is actually based on an article which I submitted to my state organization's monthly newsletter. It goes like this. I was never more aware of my kryptonite than sitting in my first class in library school. With more than nine years of experience teaching high school social studies, I figured returning to graduate school would be fun, a welcome distraction from my teaching. It wouldn't be hard. My very first class was young adult literature and the notorious 100 book project. It readily became apparent that I was completely out of my comfort zone. I floundered as others around me rattled off their favorite titles and their read alouds. Unlike many of my classmates in library school, I wasn't called to this profession because of a lifelong love of reading. Childhood family albums do not have pictures of me poring over piles of books. No one who knows me would describe me as one who devours books. I don't have a lifetime of reading on which I can rely when I arrive to my library each day. Rather, I'm obsessed with information. I revel in the access to information. I find everything interesting and I love learning. All admirable attributes if you're going to be a school librarian. So what do I do with my kryptonite? How do I address the gap in my personal knowledge and not let it adversely affect my ability to do my job? Over the years, I've cultivated my own PLN, my professional learning network. I've personalized my learning with Twitter follows, and I've regularly visited favorite blogs of leaders and children in middle grade literature. I love attending conferences. I take advantage of presentations which focus on literature. Perhaps the easiest uh, bolster to my background in KidLit is with audiobooks from my uh, public library. And it's not unusual for me to max out uh, my wait list, and I regularly make title requests. Audiobooks entertain me throughout the day, during dog walks, grocery shopping, housework. And lastly, I subscribe to a ton of podcasts. Educators of all subjects and grade levels can find relevant podcasts using their phone app. I scour archived episodes for ones which I find useful. I'm alerted when the new episodes are posted and I become a devoted listener. It isn't uncommon for me to take notes and add books to my ongoing purchase orders and fascinating author interviews and informative book reviews find their way into my interactions with students and teachers throughout the day. I embrace my kryptonite, and I've enjoyed finding ways to compensate and catch up with my fellow librarians. So, how are you addressing your kryptonite? 
and unbelievably, 56% of Americans have never listened to a podcast. And this is according to an article in the New York Times in September 2018. And I'll attach a link in the show notes. It seems incredible considering that podcasts have been an important part of my daily information diet for the past seven years. Recently, I was making some copies in the morning, and there were maybe only two or three cars in the parking lot. I didn't hear a coworker enter the workroom because I had my earbuds in. And when I realized it, I apologized, and I said I was listening to a podcast. That was met with a blank stare. And I asked if he liked listening to podcasts, and his reply was, I don't do social media. So I'm kicking myself because I have yet to find a great description of podcasts to non-listeners. Because describing a podcast as an on-demand radio program is really misleading. While many radio programs have become available in podcast format, and I'm thinking of like NPR programs, which for decades were only available on radio and became podcast episodes eventually, I'm thinking of most podcasts which have never been on the radio. Miriam Webster defines social media as, quote, forms of electronic communication through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content, end quote. David Simons posted on socialmediatoday.com on May 8, 2012, the article, Do You Consider Podcasting Part of Social Media?, he emphasized the importance of making podcasts more social by incorporating listener feedback. Podcasters, quote, want engagement and interaction. We first make sure that the content is appealing and valuable information that someone would want to share, end quote. This is a long-range goal of mine, to incorporate more listener feedback in interviews. I made the decision to proceed with posting episodes rather than holding off until I'd worked out all the aspects of interviewing. As Tracy Chun says in the Brave Educator podcast, brave before perfect. I, however, love and depend on podcasts, and I use this to fill the gaps in my education, my training, and to personalize my PD experiences. I fell in love with podcasts seven years ago. We were moving, and I was spending afternoons and weekends in our new house painting, usually alone for hours. And my husband suggested I listen to some podcasts while I was there. He would join me in the evenings for pizza and beer sitting on the floor. And as a former history teacher, I soon became addicted to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a wonderful podcast, which, because I had a lot of time, I went back and listened to their entire archive and back catalog. I could hear how the show grew and evolved and changed as hosts came and went. I listened while I weeded the garden, I walked our dogs, and packed our boxes. My initial reaction was, where was this podcast when I was teaching history in the high school? But by that time, I had graduated with my master's in library science. I was already working as an elementary library media specialist. And as I repeat in my intro, this podcast is the product of that very quandary. Perfect example of how listening to podcasts actually gives me ideas for my own podcast, Tosa's Talking Tech, episode 101, discussed the idea of neuroplasticity. And I decided to make that connection with this podcast about listening to podcasts. And if you haven't heard of that terminology, ATOSA stands for Teachers on Special Assignment. My understanding is these teachers are classroom teachers who are reassigned for a determined length of time to be consultants for their district. As explained by Tara Stewart in an article posted in Forbes.com on March 26, 2018, titled The Four Underlying Principles of Changing Your Brain, I'll attach a link in the show notes, quote, once we reach adulthood at around 25, our brain stops naturally forming new neural pathways and our habits, biases, and attitudes become more set in stone and are much harder to change, end quote. 
Neuroplasticity, quote, is the brain's ability to change itself constantly by creating new neural pathways and losing ones which are no longer used. Encouraging the brain's neuroplasticity is the key to sustained adult learning and emotional intelligence, which will help the brain remain open-minded, intuitive, and able to overcome biases throughout adulthood, end quote. There is hope, I have, that listening to a well-balanced diet of programs can be really helpful because, quote, putting your brain outside its comfort zone and developing the skills you know to struggle with can help the brain become more flexible and resilient to switching tasks and focus, end quote. And it isn't surprising that these ideas lead to further discussions regarding fixed and flexible mindset. And making a podcast, I have found that I've been very motivated to learn new skills, practice new things, and when you build the capacity for new skills, this is something that neuroplasticity is all about. If you haven't listened already to episode number 11, We Are Lifelong Learners, I think that this ties in nicely with a willingness to stretch with our new learning. In addition to filling the gaps in my own uh, education and life experience, listening to podcasts has exposed me to a younger voice. Most hosts are probably 10 years younger than myself. And I want to uh, offer a strategy which has been very helpful to me that when I discover a podcast I'd like to listen and, and subscribe to, I also look at the archive. I look at the past episodes and I start to cherry pick which ones that I'd like to listen to. You're certainly not obligated to start at the very beginning. I'd also suggest that you be open-minded. If you happen to find a podcast that is designed for English teachers or is high school focused and you teach elementary, um, sometimes you discover an unexpected gem. If you've ever encountered another podcast fan, perhaps you too have found yourselves pulling out your phones and comparing your playlist. In much the same way that we would quiz each other over the different apps we had on our phones years ago, people who are dedicated podcast listeners are always looking for new shows. So sit back. Here's a list of what you'll find on my phone. Hopefully, you'll find something which helps you do your job. For this next segment of the episode, I will be breaking down the podcasts I listen to into four categories, literature, teaching, technology, and other librarians. I will try as best I can to follow this format. I'll introduce the title of the podcast, the host, and then I'll use the description that is either provided on the website by the podcast or found in Apple Podcast. Afterwards, I'll also sometimes interject how this particular podcast helps me when I'm doing my job. The first category I'd like to address is literature. As I mentioned, literature is my kryptonite. I use podcasts because I wasn't a voracious reader growing up, nor do I necessarily have the time to read all the new books, which no doubt my students want to read. The first podcast is Books Between with Karina Allen. Books Between is a podcast to help teachers, parents, and librarians connect kids between 8 and 12 to books they'll love. There are more than 60 past episodes to enjoy, and I found this podcast to be perhaps the most expensive in that I always want to purchase the books reviewed in each episode. I especially value Karina's insight because, as I have discovered, when you work in an elementary library, not all middle grade novels are necessarily suitable for elementary age readers. The next podcast is the Children's Book Podcast, hosted by Matthew Winner, an elementary school librarian and co-founder of All the Wonders, the Children's Bookcast features insightful and sincere interviews with authors, illustrators, and everyone involved in taking a book from drawing board to bookshelf. The more I listen to this podcast, the more I've decided that certain portions of the listening audience aren't librarians. They seem to be targeting an audience of aspiring authors and illustrators of children's books, by the sound of it. The Yarn with Travis Yonker and Colby Sharp is a narrative adventure. The yarn takes listeners behind the scenes of children's literature and lets them look at all the threads that must be weaved together to create a book. Again, be sure to 
uh, visit the archive as these interviews really help you during book checkout. Scholastic Reads is another podcast about the joy and power of books and the authors, editors, and stories behind them. We explore topics important to parents, educators, and readers in all of us. It's no mystery that these all feature books and author interviews will be scholastic books and authors, but there are some terrific interviews, and this always helps during book checkout and gives us valuable background information on a book or an author. Another podcast, Kid Lit Women, a podcast by Pacey Works Studio, is a product of Grace Lynn. This podcast is interviews of essays focusing on women's and gender issues, including non-binary and gender fluidity in children's literature community and all its intersectionality. Another podcast, Book Club for Kids with Kitty Feldy, is a 20-minute podcast where middle graders talk about books. Hear what a panel of students have to say about a book they read. This helps me sell books during book checkout, especially on books I haven't read. The kids do a really good job of explaining why they like a book, and there's always a celebrity guest reader. The New York Times Book Review. And this podcast takes you inside the literary world. It is rare that I get to read adult literature. But on the off chance that I do have time, I would always consider these titles and Oftentimes, when I tell people that I'm a school librarian, they start talking about their book club and they start asking me for suggestions. And this podcast really helps in those situations. Kid Lit Radio. And the subscription provided by this show is Welcome to Kid Lit Radio, the children's literature podcast for kids. Join us each week to listen to your favorite authors and illustrators featured on Kid Lit TV. I will especially tune into episodes on books I am considering to add to my purchase order. Another podcast I like listening to is Pop Culture Happy Hour by NPR. Now, Pop Culture Happy Hour is a fun and freewheeling chat about the latest movies, televisions, books, comics, and music. I tend to be more selective when I listen to these episodes, and I make sure to tune in when the topic happens to be children's books being made into movies. So I'll listen to their reviews of Netflix's Series of Unfortunate Events, A Wrinkle in Time, Mary Poppins, really any time the review is of something that my students might enjoy watching. The next category of podcasts I listen to are the ones that have to do with teaching. I teach all day. I teach six classes a day, young fives through grade five, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't discover some aspect of my teaching or classroom management or lesson design, which could use some improvement. These podcasts offer great suggestions and resources to address all of these issues. The first one I want to mention is The Cult of Pedagogy with Jennifer Gonzalez. The description says, Teaching strategies, classroom management, education reform, educational technology. If it has something to do with teaching, we're talking about it. On the podcast, I interview educators, students, administrators, and parents about the psychological and social dynamics of school, trade secrets, and other juicy things you'll never learn in a textbook. Other episodes feature me on my own, offering advice on ways to make your teaching more effective and fun. I would like to especially mention that during the summer, when so many of these education-related podcasts are literally on vacation, going through the back catalog of The Cult of Pedagogies, more than 114 episodes, has really helped me uh, during this sort of dry spell when a lot of these podcasts go on a break. The next podcast I'd like to mention is the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast with Betsy Potash. And the description is, this podcast is full of creative teaching strategies, classroom ideas, and inspiration for middle and high school English teachers. Betsy Potash from Spark Creativity presents new ideas for immediate classroom use, making it that much easier for teachers to stay creative in the midst of their busy lives. As somebody who teaches elementary library, I can still find so much in these episodes to apply to my own lessons. I especially like the conversations about encouraging reader choice. I've listened to many of the episodes from the archive, which has over 58 to choose from. 
The next podcast I wanted to mention is Partial Credit. Partial Credit is the podcast that brings together education, pop culture, and shenanigans. Your host, Jeffrey Heil, Donnie Piercy, and Jesse Lubinsky span three generations, and they've got you covered coast to coast. Sit back, relax, and earn your partial credit. I would like to mention right now that the ending to this episode was inspired when I heard the partial credit most recent episode uh, this past week. The next episode I wanted to mention is The Brave Educator with Rob Harsh and Tracy Chun. Are you an educator looking for inspiration and ideas to introduce innovation and technology in your classroom or library? Looking for tools and strategies to implement in your program? The Brave Educator Podcast is two educators talking about tech, makerspaces, innovation, and more. We hope you'll join us. The next category of podcasts I listen to are those about technology and podcasting. My Michigan teaching certificate is for K-12 school library. It also includes technology. So I've taught K-5 through technology while also working as a school librarian. I need to stay in the loop, and it helps me with my committee work for my district and offering building and district PD. And though my husband and my sons would think it laughable, I do get a lot of tech questions, and listening to podcasts helps me in this respect. And since I don't personally know anybody else who podcasts, as a podcaster, listening to tech and podcast-related podcasts is a great way to get tips and advice. The first podcast I'll mention is Check This Out with Ryan and Brian. With over 100 episodes, Brian Briggs and Ryan O'Donnell share the latest in ed tech with an eye for what the listener can implement tomorrow. As I mentioned before, Tosa's Talking Tech podcast with Tom Covington and Michael Jepcott are two teachers talking about technology integration, giving ideas, troubleshooting, talking about SAMR, and why we need tech in the classrooms. This was a great way to get PD out to our teachers, and we thought we should share it with everyone. This is also another podcast with a huge archive of over 100 episodes. Another podcast I listen to is Google Teacher Tribe. The Google Teacher Tribe podcast is a weekly podcast designed to give K-12 educators practical ideas for using G Suite and other Google tools, hosted by Matt Miller of Ditch That Textbook fame and Casey Bell of Shake Up Learning fame. With more than 70 episodes, this podcast is one I always return to the website so I can look at the show notes, delve into their resource page, links, and to their individual blog posts. The House of Ed Tech with Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech shares stories from teachers and creators about education technology, recommends the valuable tools, tips, and resources to integrate technology into your classroom and instruction, and explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach along with the impact that technology is having on education. With more than 120 episodes, you can learn just about any ed tech that you need to in the archive. The Chromebook Classroom podcast with John Sowash. Um, He hosts this podcast that explores how Chromebooks are impacting the K-12 classroom. Because the majority of computers in our buildings now are Chromebooks, I've relied on this podcast. And I've also attended some of the presentations given by John Sowash at McCall. Educational Duct Tape. This is a brand new podcast with Uh, host Jake Miller, and the Educational Duct Tape Podcast focus on viewing ed tech as a tool to meet uh, goals, addressing learning standards, and solve problems in the classroom. Much as duct tape is used as a tool that solves a plethora of problems in our lives, I sit down each week with a different inspiring guest with awesome ideas for using tech in the classroom to share and discuss some awesome ideas. I also want to include at this point BBC Trending. And this might seem like a strange addition, but BBC Trending is an in-depth report on the world of social media, and I use what I learn when I teach digital citizenship and internet safety to my students. And it's also a global perspective, and one that I really crave when so much of what I consume is focused on the United States. Lastly, I do want to mention the feed, which is the 
official Libsyn podcast, and this is hosted by Rob Walsh and Elsie Escobar, and they discuss podcast strategies, tips, media hosting, and all things Libsyn. And this is the media host that I happen to use, so it really does help me in answering a lot of the questions because I don't have anybody else to ask. The last category of podcasts I listen to have to do with listening to other librarian podcasts. This first podcast is called The Biblio Dames, hosted by Nicole Graham and Jenny Stafford. And these are two librarians who work together in an urban high school in Fort Worth, Texas. We want to focus on how we will integrate technology into our everyday life in the library on top of all of our more traditional librarian duties. We will talk about all aspects of our lives in the library, including our successes and failures. Another podcast I listen to is the American Library's Dewey Decibel podcast. The Dewey Decibel podcast is a popular podcast series from the American Libraries, the magazine of the American Library Association. Each month, your host and American Library senior editor, Phil Moorhart, will be your guide to conversations with librarians, authors, and thinkers and scholars about topics from around the library world and beyond. This podcast provides me with some insight into the world of public libraries. And it's fascinating to hear about their perspective and issues which interest their listeners. Finally, The Librarian is In is a production of the New York Public Library, and it's a podcast about books, culture, and what to read next. It helps to listen to librarian podcasters, and they raise issues which give me perspective and help me rethink my own library. Finally, I am recording on Super Bowl Sunday. I fall squarely into the camp of those who tune in just for the commercials. I do have a library-related pick. My favorite originally aired years before I would have been able to appreciate it, but at some point it must have been replayed. It is the Xerox copier commercial from the Super Bowl in 1977. I've included a link in the show notes, and the quality is a little fuzzy, but I'm glad that we still get a chance to watch it. The camera zooms in on a monastery, as chants can be heard, and the scene shows a monk, Brother Dominic, hard at work, illuminating a page of scripture. He delivers it to his superior, who, impressed, asked for 500 more just like it. Bewildered, Brother Dominic leaves the room, has a sudden realization, and heads into a door of a 1977 workspace with a behemoth Xerox copy machine. He marvels at the speed and produces a stack of finished manuscripts for his superior, who declares, with his eyes towards heaven, it's a miracle. I have shown this clip to my students when we do a lesson on the history of writing and libraries. It's challenging to impress on students just how much writing has evolved and how important access to the earliest libraries and how they have moved from being restricted and chained volumes uh, to finally the free libraries of the 20th century. And just for funsies, I also included in the show notes a link to the 40-year remake of this commercial, which reflects all the innovations in Xerox technology. I would like to thank you for listening today. If you found this podcast helpful, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Share this podcast with other school librarians in your district and your PLN. Consider leaving a rating as it will help you other school librarians find this podcast. I would like to thank composer Nazar Ryback at hooksounds.com for the music you've heard today. And as always, I invite your feedback and contributions. Please email me at schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter. Our next episode will be self-published books and your collection. I hope you will tune in.